All right, just to let folks know, we are live streaming on YouTube. Um, I see that Delegate Van Volkenberg just joined us. We do have a couple more legislators that have registered. Um, so we'll give them just another minute or two and then we'll go ahead and get started. All right, Emily, I think I should go ahead. Yeah, I think I can admit people as they hop on. Um, we do have a couple more that register, but I also don't want to hold everybody up either because we got a lot of information to get through. So, um, Dr. Lane, go ahead and get started. All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us, especially our, our members of the General Assembly. Uh, we have been briefing legislators over the past two days on uh, a variety of topics. I'll, I'll talk through the four topics we're going to uh, do here in a moment. Um, the I will give a presentation uh, to start, and then our, our we have a presentation from the Board of Education and our Department of Special Education Student Services. Uh, and uh, some of those are uh, will be uh, recorded from yesterday, and then we'll we'll do Q and A at the end of those. But I'll talk through logistics in a minute. Uh, before I do that, I wanted to uh, ask De Delegate Tyler if uh, you wanted to say good morning. Thank you, Dr. Lane. I, I certainly do. And, and good morning to everyone who's joining us. Um, certainly, you know, as uh, the pandemic has uh, uh, constantly increasing and it has a, certainly has affected our, our education system, this is a good time for us to um, hear conversation and to get an update of what's going on um, in Virginia regarding our, our vulnerable ones, and that's our children. So again, thank you, um, Dr. Lane and your staff for your presenting this because this information is certainly gonna be essential to us as we head back to the General Assembly this year. Again, thank you and good morning to everyone. Well, good morning, Delegate Tyler, and thank you to all of our legislators for joining us today. Um, Emily is going to pull up our presentation, and I will begin in just a moment. So again, welcome to our uh, Department of Education briefing. Uh, we had a, a great day with legislators yesterday and a lot of great questions and, and shared a lot of uh, great information. Uh, the legislators here today, we will be repeating the same content. Uh, so this was an opportunity for those that were not able to attend yesterday uh, to hear the information and ask questions as well. Uh, on the next slide, I'm going to give you an overview of our briefing today. Uh, first, I will walk through an update on the COVID-19 uh, uh, response in, in Virginia's public schools. We'll focus on remote learning, uh, access to devices and, and the internet, uh, the impact on funding, and much more. Then you'll hear a presentation from Dr. Samantha Hollins in our Special Education and Student Services Department on uh, activities there. Uh, that will be uh, uh, recording from yesterday, but uh, we will be here to answer questions. And then I'll come back and share some ongoing work at the Department of Education. And finally, our board president, Dan Gecker, will present information from the Board of Ed, also um, a, a repeat of uh, uh, yesterday. Um, after each of the four segments, we will stop and take as many questions uh, or, or, or concerns or, or just have discussion uh, as you would like. Uh, and so uh, please know that while we're presenting, uh, feel free to drop questions in the chat, and we will answer those uh, questions from our legislators as well. Uh, and with that, that, I will start with our presentation on 
COVID-19 and public education. On this first slide, I will uh, share some information with you uh, of a map that will outline what the modality of learning uh, looks like in each of our, our public schools. And so, and if you'll go to the next slide, this map on the right is actually uh, uh, hot off the press. Uh, yesterday, we released this after the meeting. So uh, this is a slightly different map than you saw yesterday. And in, in yesterday's presentation, we shared the map of what the modalities look like for school divisions as of September 22. Uh, yesterday, we released this new map. Uh, what you will see here is that about a third of our school divisions are still fully remote and about two thirds of our school divisions are doing some type of in-person learning with students. Um, it, it goes anywhere from what we would call a partial hybrid, where it's a, a hybrid approach to learning, maybe one or two days a week with students. And a partial hybrid is if it's with just some of the students in the school. So a, as you know, from the governor's three-phase plan, we recommended, uh, and I'll go into this in a lot more detail uh, later, we recommended that uh, maybe you just start with your most vulnerable learners, and uh, so a few school divisions are doing that. In beige is, is uh, what we call the all hybrid. That is where all students are attending, but maybe only one or two days a week. And then the yellow and the purple are school divisions that are uh, uh, a little bit more aggressive about their in-person opening with, with uh, three to five days a week uh, with all students. Uh, this is a significant change from the map that we showed yesterday on September 22. I, I, I predicted that this map would say this yesterday, but when we opened school in September, uh, we were closer to 50% of school districts being all virtual, but it was predominantly a lot of our larger school divisions that were all virtual. And so that uh, really led to about 80% of our students being virtual at the beginning of the school year. Now with maybe a third of our school divisions uh, fully remote and two thirds of our school divisions being in person, I think, uh, you're looking at closer to about 50% of students uh, being remote and about 50% being virtual. Keep in mind, even if you're in a school division that were purple, where you were fully in person, uh, uh, a large number of the students would be uh, choosing virtual uh, on their own. Uh, Hanover County, which is the, the, the purple county right there in the middle of the map north of Richmond, is an, is an in-person school division, but Hanover County has 38% of their students choosing virtual. And so that's a little bit of the landscape of, of where we are today, and that's, that's new as of yesterday. Um, the, but the, the department has provided a number of resources to support school divisions. Uh, of course, the governor uh, originally closed schools on March 13th uh, for uh, two weeks. Uh, two, 10 days later, on March 23rd, the governor closed schools for the remainder of the year. Uh, and then in June, the governor released the three-phase plan for opening schools. And so, whereas school divisions immediately had to implement continuity of learning in the, in the spring uh, and, and a number of waivers from the Department of Education, uh, now schools are open, in, again, in these modalities. And we issued in the summer the Recover, Redesign, and Restart 2020 document. That was nearly a 135-page guide to support schools on how to open in this context with focusing on the physical distancing and, and everything uh, that's necessary uh, to keep students safe for in-person learning. Uh, we've also answered well over 100 frequently asked questions on our website and continue to uh, work with our school divisions to make sure that they have answers to the questions that they need. Uh, we have targeted equity at the center of our plan. Um, again, when I, when I talk through the three-phase plan, I'll go into a lot more, more detail on this, but uh, in the earliest phases of the governor's reopening plan, we wanted to make sure that the students that needed in-person instruction the most would access that first. Uh, since March 13th, I have met with superintendents every week uh, on a weekly phone call uh, on, on Tuesday mornings uh, through October. In October, we made the decision now that the situation was starting to stabilize uh, across Virginia to do those calls as needed. And we're still meeting with superintendents about twice a month to uh, address their concerns and questions. Um, 
the of course the governor's three phase plan uh, was rolled out in June, and then uh, just a, a several weeks ago now, I guess uh, the VDH released what they call the pandemic metrics and outbreaks in school setting dashboard, which is the the data and metrics uh, provided by the Department of Health based on CDC guidelines to help school divisions think through when it's appropriate to open in person. And so I'm gonna jump now to uh, the next slide, which is a summary of some of, of the data that we're using to make decisions about opening schools. This is a document provided by the CDC. Uh, and in a moment, I'll show you how we use this data to align the Virginia Department of Health's uh, pandemic metric dashboard to the three phases of the governor's plan to make recommendations to schools. Uh, but this is how CDC tells us to assess whether a school division is in the highest risk of transmission through the lowest risk of transmission. And here you will see that there are two core metrics that CDC asks schools to focus on. The first is the total number of new cases per 100,000 people within the last 14 days. That's an aggregate number. And so you can see here that if, if your total number of cases per 100,000 people over the last 14 days is greater than 200, you're a community considered in the highest risk of transmission in schools. And that goes to having less than five, which would put you in the lowest transmission risk of transmission in schools. The second core metric is uh, percent positivity. So that's the percentage of RT-PCR tests that are positive during the last 14 days. And again, a school division whose uh, PCR tests are over 10% are considered in the highest risk of transmission. Those that are under 3% are in the lowest risk of transmission. But it's important to note that even though these two core factors are, are the key factors that school divisions are looking at, there are a number of other factors that Virginia Department of Health provides for our school divisions to help them assess uh, uh, this decision. Uh, local health department directors work closely with superintendents. There are nuances in, in communities that are important to take into account. And on, on, on top of that, there are other metrics that we look at. The, on the pandemic dashboard at, at VDH, there are also regional metrics in a variety of other factors. They look at the availability of hospital beds, the number of ICU hospitalizations, the number of COVID cases that are in those hospital beds, uh, the, the availability of PPE in hospitals. So there are other factors, but CDC will tell you these are the two core factors, and these are the, the two factors you hear school divisions uh, talking about the most. But they do assess all of those other factors in making their determination. But the third thing that the CDC says here at the bottom is whether or not you're in the highest risk to the lowest risk of transmission, you must also be successfully uh, implementing the five key mitigation strategies uh, in helping with your decision making. So you might have cases be maybe a touch higher than the lowest risk of transmission, but if you're successfully implementing all five of these strategies, it could move you along the continuum. And so uh, the five key strategies are first, the consistent and correct use of masks. I will say in talking to our, our school districts and, and, and doing tours, I did a, a tour of Southwest Virginia just a couple weeks ago, uh, pretty much every school division that's doing in-person learning is, is requiring staff and students to wear masks in school. Um, we recommended that, but, but uh, our, our guidance thus far has gone short of requiring it for students, uh, but the, pretty much every school division has taken that recommendation and is doing that. Uh, we also recommend, uh, uh, as part of the five key mitigation strategies, uh, that students uh, be social distancing to the highest extent possible. Obviously, the six foot of social, physical distancing in the classrooms is, is the gold standard, uh, but uh, based on uh, science that we learned from the World, World Health Organization, the Virginia Department of Health did allow that to go to as low as three feet as long as it's combined with the use of masks. But again, based on my uh, anecdotal experience in tours, most school divisions are implementing the six foot of physical distancing in classrooms when they're open. Of course, hand hygiene and respiratory etiquette is essential, cleaning and disinfection of schools, and then contact tracing, uh, not done necessarily by the school, but in collaboration with the local health department. So if a school division is implementing all five of those strategies correctly and consistency, 
that would move them towards the lowest risk of transmission. And then, of course, if they were not doing any of these strategies, uh, they would be in the highest risk of transmission. So in the next slide, I'm going to talk through how we took those five areas and aligned them to the governor's three-phase plan so that school divisions could handle the fluctuations that go on with cases in their communities. And so if a school division, after looking at those two core factors and the five key mitigation strategies, plus all of the regional data that we produced for them, determines that they're in the highest risk, then we recommend that those schools implement what we call our phase one recommendations. And in phase one, uh, we ask school divisions to be predominantly remote. However, we want to make sure that students with disabilities, especially those with the greatest needs, uh, and, and as long as parents and the IEP teams approve, receive in-person instruction first. All other students, again, are pretty much being served remotely, uh, but during this phase, we ask our school divisions to have plans to return to in-person once the data in their community uh, su suggests uh, a, a lower risk. Uh, then if a school division is in the moderate or high risk based on those CDC factors, we recommend that they implement the phase two uh, recommendations. In phase two, we're still predominantly remote, but in this phase, we ask that they prioritize students with disabilities, English learners, and our youngest learners, pre-K through three, with in-person instruction. And so uh, I think uh, Fairfax County is a great example of a school division that just transitioned on that map that you saw to, to this type of thinking. They're, they're focusing on their earliest learners in their first phase of, of in-person learning. And again, uh, other than these uh, students that need in-person instruction the most, uh, we do recommend that all other students be served remotely and that uh, you know, our, our staff members that are at highest risk of severe illness also have uh, remote learning uh, uh, instruction opportunities. Then if a school division is in the lowest or lower risk categories, what we would call the green shades on the last slide, uh, then we recommend that all students receive some in-person instruction. We still want to make sure we maintain physical distancing, masking, cleaning, and everything in the five key mitigation strategies. And so oftentimes, even though all students can begin coming back to school in the lowest or lower risk phases of phase three, uh, because of the physical distancing required in classrooms of six feet, we, we cannot in most school divisions get every student into the classroom every day. And so this has necessitated hybrid schedules. Uh, in an average classroom square footage with 25 students at six foot of physical distancing, you can usually get 12 to 15 students. So most school divisions have gone to splitting their classes in half, and essentially the most popular hybrid schedule we've seen is a two-day on, two-day off, where students will go to school for two days, they'll clean and disinfect the building with a deep clean and do an all virtual or remote day on Wednesdays, and then the other half of the students come into that same classroom the other two days so that they can maintain the physical distancing. That physical distancing is also necessary on buses. Um, many school divisions have gone closer to the three foot of physical distancing on buses, uh, but combine that with the use of masks. And so a 55 passenger bus often will have say uh, 23 to 25 students on it at, at full capacity with the uh, physical distancing. Of course, again, remote learning options should be available to all students and staff, especially those staff at higher risk uh, of severe illness. And again, even in this lowest and lower risk category, we're seeing a significant percentage of families choose virtual even while their school divisions are doing uh, more in-person instruction. On the next slide, I'm going to transition now from talking about the metrics and decision making that schools are, are using to the needs that they have in the technology space. Uh, over the next few slides, I'll talk about the significant expansion that we've done to virtual learning in the Commonwealth. But before I do that, I'm going to start with the, the graph on the right. This is a map of what we see in terms of the need for computing devices. And you can see that the total need for computing devices in the Commonwealth uh, to get to a full one-to-one -one as of May, so we haven't surveyed again since May, obviously with CARES Act funding and everything else, this number has come significantly down. But when we started this project, we had about a 427,000, well, 428,000 uh, device need, which would have totaled a cost of nearly $130 million. And you can see that broken out by grade bands. Uh, we also heard from school divisions that around 125,000 students had no access to the internet and needed mobile hotspots. Now, obviously a number of students that 
could access a mobile hotspot still can't get the internet because there's not service to the residents. And so you can see uh, right around this time, we began to issue our CARES Act funding, which I'll talk about a lot later, uh, which was nearly $238 million. And so a number of our school divisions have uh, significantly reduced this, but you can see the greatest needs in technology uh, are falling in Southside Virginia, towards the Northern Neck, uh, some pockets in uh, Southwest Virginia, and then on the, on the Southern side of, of Northern Virginia. And so we began immediately to uh, implement work to try to defray this in addition to the CARES Act funding, which allowed them to purchase devices. Uh, nearly every school division that has a, a remote uh, platform at this point is, is meeting that need for students, but to, if we had to go completely to virtual again, and, and some students were not able to learn in person, we certainly still have uh, some device needs. Um, so what we did to address this issue is we set aside a number of our funds uh, to support this. The governor had a discretionary fund of $66 million. He set aside $18 million to issue grants to school divisions that still had needs after they spent their CARES Act funds. And uh, that allowed school divisions to purchase MIFIs, which was another word for mobile hotspots, uh, and, and laptops. Uh, after we did the first round of uh, uh, this funding that we call the Vision Grant, we actually put another $9 million into that. And so now the, um, the, the total is nearly $28 million that we issued beyond the CARES Act to support these needs. To have a successful remote and virtual learning program, uh, in addition to the, the high quality in, in instruction, professional development that's needed, we think of it as a three-legged stool. Uh, to have a successful virtual program, every student and teacher must have access to the internet, every student and teacher must have a device, and every student and teacher must have a platform to deliver instruction through. And so on the next slide, in a moment, I'm gonna talk about Virtual Virginia uh, because we essentially eliminated that need uh, uh, for a learning management system. And so here you'll see Virtual Virginia expanded significantly. We asked last year the General Assembly to fund uh, a learning management system for every school division in the state before COVID hit. And that was originally in the budget. It was unallotted. So we used CARES Act funding in the state set aside to roll out a learning management system to every school division in the Commonwealth. Now, many school divisions, uh, like say Henrico had their own uh, learning management system. They were allowed to continue using their own learning management system. But through Virtual Virginia, we have provided a learning management system to any school division that didn't have one. And so we can safely say that now every school division in the Commonwealth has access to a free statewide learning management system. We also significantly expanded the content that we provide for teachers to deliver instruction in a virtual setting. Uh, you probably know Virtual Virginia as a high school program. It was a program prior to the pandemic where the state provided teachers to teach in a virtual setting, mostly synchronously, so that students could have access to courses that they may not be able to access in their home high school. So that content was already available. Over the last six months, we have now built content K through 12. So now Virtual Virginia is no longer just a high school program. It is a K through 12 program. And we rolled out content K through five for teachers to use, six through eight for teachers to use and continue to expand the content that we had in nine through 12. We're also building now and getting ready to release for the first time ever using CARES funding, asynchronous courses for all grades in all core subject areas. So if a student doesn't have access to the internet, the good news is the learning management system in Virtual Virginia can be used offline. So as long as that student has quick access to, to the internet, even just once a week, they can fully download all of our asynchronous courses. Uh, we've seen a lot of innovation in this space. School divisions have put uh, Wi-Fi uh, signals on top of their buildings so that parents can drive up to the school in off hours and access the internet. And I told a story yesterday in Louisa County, they took trailers and put solar units on it and put uh, essentially internet routers outside of grocery stores. So a parent could even go to the grocery store, take their child's device, upload and download all the content for the week and go home. Now, even, even beyond that, our school divisions have done other incredible things like 
uh, uh, sending flash drives home for every student, delivering packets home by buses, and it, just a lot of really uh, uh, cool innovation going on in that space. But now, with the release of these fully asynchronous courses, school divisions could theoretically not have to put those packets together for remote learning and could use our content to deliver all of the instruction in the core subject areas K through 12. And then we doubled the number of enrollments for those synchronous virtual teaching experiences through Virtual Virginia. As I said, for years, we've been delivering uh, virtual in instruction uh, from the department uh, at, through vir Virtual Virginia. And, and typically what happens, I'm sure you know this, we give school divisions 15 free seats for every course at the high school level. We eliminated essentially that cap and have made it so that any school division that needed virtual teachers through Virtual Virginia could access that for free. So we, we, we did cap it with a doubling uh, of those numbers. And so Virtual Virginia went from teaching 6,000 students a year to now 12,000 students a year directly from the Virtual Virginia teachers. Now, recognizing that still some of our students didn't have access to the internet, we also launched in partnership with public media stations all throughout the Commonwealth, the Virginia TV Classroom, where we do teacher-based televised instruction on TV uh, uh, every day. And we recognize that many of our Spanish language students could not access uh, the internet so we partnered with 1380 AM Radio Poder out of Richmond to deliver educational radio content on the radio. And many of our Spanish language students uh, uh, obviously don't live in the Richmond area or could listen to the Richmond radio signal or maybe can't access it on, online. So uh, one of the really cool things that 1380 did is they actually created an 800 line so that Spanish speaking students all throughout the Commonwealth could call into the radio show and listen to the live instruction in Spanish. Um, so the, the work to support virtual learning has been extensive and I've been really, really proud of what we've done. So just a, a few more tidbits on Virtual Virginia on the next slide. Um, first, I would like you to know that we now have 100% of our school divisions implementing at least one of our Virtual Virginia programs. So that was huge. We've, we've been looking to expand this program for many years. Uh, of course, you know that we have the statewide learning uh, management system now through Virtual Virginia, but keep in mind that is funded through CARES Act funding. So one of the things that we'll need is the ongoing funding to make sure that we can continue to make sure this learning management system is available to uh, school divisions even after the pandemic. I believe that you will find that these new virtual tools will become core to the fabric of how we teach even into the future. And so this, this statewide learning management system is, is going to be essential. Also, just before uh, the pandemic, we launched Go Open VA, which is an open education resources repository so that teachers could share lessons all throughout the Commonwealth, remix those, reuse them, and our partnership with Go Open VA and Virtual Virginia makes it seamless so that teachers can access all of that content in those platforms. Uh, and then the last thing I'd say is we've been teaching virtually at the Commonwealth through Virtual Virginia for over a decade. So we've been offering free professional development to all Virginia teachers led by the Virtual Virginia instructors who, who have been doing this for years so that they could learn how to teach more successfully in the virtual space. In all, it took us about $5.8 million of the CARES Act funding uh, to do that. And what I can tell you is that the virtual learning that students experienced in the spring is vastly different from what students are experiencing now. The virtual learning that students are experiencing now is far superior to what we were able to do in the spring. We transitioned on a dime in the spring, but now our teachers have had months and months to plan and their heroic efforts have just been incredible. And so I, I think you'd be pleased to see the, the growth of virtual learning over the past six months. And I think it will have a uh, long-term positive impact on the Commonwealth, even though we all would have preferred not to have to deal uh, with, with COVID. So I'm gonna transition now uh, to the last section of this first briefing to talk a little bit about enrollment trends. Um, of course, the UPASS language in the special session that asked us not to revise uh, ADM payments based on projections. Uh, we, did, uh, we do each year collect uh, average daily membership from a projection standpoint on September 30th. The final ADM on March 31 is what actually typically drives funding. 
And what I can tell you is that uh, assessing that data, and we're going to put that out uh, uh, publicly here in the coming days, uh, division by division to our superintendents, uh, but we're seeing about a 38,000 student reduction in ADM over this time last year. Now, that amounts to uh, uh, a significant amount of money. Now, so I know the General Assembly is looking at uh, potentially holding school divisions harmless. And we do have a few school divisions whose ADM are actually up. Uh, and you, the, the, the important point to keep in mind is you have essentially budgeted already for those additional 38,000 students. So your school divisions are asking you to hold them harmless and essentially keep the funding where it is. And we believe that if you implemented a hold harmless uh, strategy with school divisions so they don't face significant re reductions in funding during this time, it will not actually take any new investment from what's already in your budget. So that's that's a really important point. Hey, Dr. Lane, and so, this is Skylar. Yeah. What, what school divisions are up? Uh, you know, I don't have to memorize, but I, I know um, uh, a couple examples uh, are, uh, we have some school divisions that partner with private virtual vendors to deliver uh, virtual instruction, and any school division in the Commonwealth can sign up for those. So, um, uh, yeah, King and Queen, Patrick County, so on and so forth. That's that's what I thought you were going to say. I mean, isn't that cannibalizing from other school divisions? I, I mean, I mean, it's baffling to me that they can partner with a private virtual and then get state money. Um, to buffer their budgets at the expense of other school systems who don't partner with that. I, that strikes me as something that has to be fixed because that's not right. Uh, certainly that's a policy decision for the General Assembly, uh, but the, yeah. the, the current language in the code is being implemented appropriately. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, and I will, I promise I'm pausing for questions uh, just here in a moment, but uh, just just wrapping up uh, the the enrollment piece. One other one other thing that I would say is uh, twelve thousand of those thirty eight thousand uh, decreases in enrollment are in kindergarten. Uh, the code does allow parents to defer their decision on kindergarten uh, for one year, and so I do think that twelve thousand of those students you may see in a bubble with next year's kindergarten class being uh, exceptionally large uh, compared to past years. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about staffing, which is on the next slide. And so again, we have seen uh, our, our, our shortages increase. Uh, obviously, uh, we have a number of staff in the state that are at higher risk of severe illness. Uh, and for that reason, and, and uh, you know, especially teachers that were closer to retirement age, made some decisions to accelerate their retirement in the, in the context of COVID. Uh, we continue to see shortages in special education, uh, but because of the additional number of buses we need with physical distancing, uh, we're seeing significant shortages in bus drivers and other support staff. Uh, keep in mind, some of, the, some of the most heroic efforts happened in our support staff. Uh, uh, our bus drivers were delivering meals even in the uh, most strict times during the pandemic, our, our cafeteria workers were coming in to make sure every student was fed. Even while we closed on March 13th, we kept school nutrition programs running through a variety of ways, even delivering meals straight to parents and, and families' houses uh, throughout the pandemic. And, our, and we make sure that uh, we're, we're keeping uh, the nutritional security of our, our, our students sound. Uh, but with extra physical distancing, with, with teachers needing um, uh, to teach virtually, uh, with school divisions transitioning to in-person, extra staffing continues to be a concern and will be needed. Obviously, we've been able to support a lot of that with CARES Act funding and the CRF funding uh, that, that, you, that you have uh, uh, given the school divisions, but uh, there's no doubt that our uh, teacher shortage numbers are going to be up. We collect teacher shortage data as of October 30th every year, so that, that, that time frame just ended. We've just opened the collection portal and in the coming weeks, maybe I, I, yesterday, I think I said it could be as ready as early as December. After uh, at getting some questions from the General Assembly, I asked staff, they're saying that that report actually typically comes out in January, but we'll provide you a list of the top shortage areas, where the shortages are, in what subjects uh, in the near future. 
Uh, and so just two mass last slides before we pause. The next is on how we've maintained uh, core instructional components. The department has issued over 49 waivers and relief measures uh, to support uh, the, uh, the pandemic. Uh, and so I, I can tell you that the, the flexibility that you have given us to issue these waivers is absolutely essential to the success of our being able to keep school, school divisions moving. It made it possible so that all of our students could graduate on time, that we're on track to graduate. It allowed us to promote students to the next grade level, that we're on track to be promoted, and it's continued to allow us to provide flexibilities uh, so that learning can move forward in a successful way. One of the big waivers that we're working on with school divisions right now is the waiver of the 990 clock hour requirement each year. But what we have done, just so you know, to ensure that we have strong instruction, we have not waived the core instruction hour requirements. And so this, this allows us to ensure that our students are getting uh, the, the minimum number of hours needed to be successful in core instruction, while at the same time not waiving requirements that they still have CTE, Fine Arts, Health and PE, and all other programs. We have also waived accreditation for the assessments that would be given this year. Uh, I've gotten a lot of questions about assessments. To date, the federal government, uh, Secretary DeVos has been very clear that they're not going to waive uh, federal testing assessments. Uh, I've been following uh, comments from uh, uh, President-elect Biden's uh, transition team, and thus far, the, uh, at, even as there uh, is looking to be a, a new president in office in January, I, I don't believe that uh, you're going to see federal testing waivers uh, from the new administration either. Uh, there, there seems to be broad bipartisan consensus that they want to know how students are doing. And so for that reason, whereas we've waived accreditation to take the pressure off the accountability on the assessments in the context of everything that's going on, we have not waived assessments uh, at this time. Obviously, we'll continue to follow the transition closely uh, to January and, and uh, can circle back uh, it, if, if waivers end up coming from the federal government on that. And so finally, I'll just wrap up uh, with funding. Uh, these are the, the three major relief packages that we've used to support schools. Of course, the big one is the first one, which is the CARES Act funding. Uh, we call this the ESSER Fund, Elementary Secondary School Education Relief Fund. That was $238 million. 90% of that went directly to school divisions through a Title I formula, so it, it was overweighted towards school divisions with uh, higher percentages of students in poverty. The department held back 10% of that money for uh, state activities, and you saw, as an example, what we were able to do with that with Virtual Virginia. The governor also had a $66 million uh, discretionary fund. $43 million went to pre-K through 12. Uh, of course, the other $23 million went to higher education. Uh, 27 million of that went to uh, uh, device and internet needs, as I mentioned. 10 million of that uh, went to early childhood. Uh, we split the funding for Virtual Virginia with ESSER, so you can see some of the Virtual Virginia funding came from GEAR as well. And we supported our school nutrition programs. And then just a huge thank you to the General Assembly and the governor. We just released another 220 million to schools earlier this month. And rather than doing that on the Title I formula, you put that on a per pupil basis so that it went uh, uh, based on division size rather than poverty since we had done that uh, 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 before. Uh, and so uh, here there's just one important piece. The coronavirus relief fund uh, must essentially be liquidated by December 30th. And so uh, whereas the coronavirus relief fund is supporting a lot of our efforts in schools, it is not on the whole being used as in staffing like ESSER is because of the fact that it does expire uh, mid-year. And so that is our, our briefing on COVID-19, the department's response in a nutshell. I, I think that uh, you should be proud of the efforts that are going on in our school divisions. I think you should be really proud of the efforts going on at the Department of Education. The team here has worked tirelessly for months uh, to make sure that we're supporting schools and I think that you, you will see that Virginia is a leader in our response to the pandemic. And so I will pause there and answer any questions that you may have. I've got two questions, if no one else is gonna ask. Um, my first question relates to how you see the localities actually um, 
when you go back to the first part of your presentation and you talk about kind of the guidance and the guidelines and schools following them and localities following them, I guess I wonder just um, from a global perspective, because I'm mostly focused here in Richmond, kind of do you, do you see a fairly uniform response to following the science and following uh, following kind of the guidance as written by the CDC? I mean, I know here in this area, there was a kind of blow up around Chesterfield's response to go back. And I know just enough to be dangerous, not enough to talk intelligently about it, so I'm not going to. But like, I don't know. I guess I'd ask you to assess the locality's response to kind of the scientifically based criteria set forward by the federal and state governments. Yeah, and doc, Dr. Lane, if, if I could, because uh, uh, Skylar went ahead and asked a very similar question, so if I could kind of get, get mine in there as well. I, I, I'm curious about the mismatch or whether how much of a mismatch there is between uh, the phasing um, and what, what schools are actually doing. And so you might have a, a school that is scientifically in one category, but they're out of sync and operating as if they're in a, in a different phase. And what is the role of the state in identifying that and coming in and talking with the, with the division um, about you know, what, what their plan is? Yeah, thank you. Well, a, as you know, each school division was required to submit a health plan and an instructional plan to the department. We did review all of those plans and, and provided feedback at and we continue to do that as they come in with updates. But to answer kind of the, the broader question, you know, are most school divisions in alignment with our guidance? Um, I would say that there are definitely school divisions that are being more aggressive than the metrics would call for, and there are school divisions being less aggressive than the metrics call for, and there are school divisions that are doing exactly what the metrics say at the time that they say it. Uh, and so I think it's important to, to remember a couple things. Uh, their successful implementation of the five key mitigation strategies are an important component in looking at the decision. And so, you know, you have some school divisions, smaller school divisions say that even before the pandemic had 10 students in a classroom. And with 10 students in a classroom, if they did a hybrid schedule with five students in a classroom of six foot distancing with masks, cleaning and disinfecting, new ionization HVAC, even if they were in moderate, their strategy may allow them to be a, a little bit more aggressive. The other thing I'd say is that sometimes in our school divisions, there are nuances to the data that are important in a, assessing the decision. You may have a school division where one facility where, you know, no parents and students are impacted by that facility are actually driving the numbers way up. And so oftentimes the local health department will work with the superintendent, look at each of those nuances, look at the data, look at what the regional data says, but it's also important that when we look at that data, but both of those are really looking at burden, right? So uh, it's important to look at trends. If, if you have moved from, from red to orange to yellow and your trend is decreasing, even though your, your burden may still be yellow, you may feel more comfortable, especially if you have your five key mitigation strategies being a touch more aggressive. Uh, so we do have conversations with superintendents. As I said, I speak to superintendents all the time. At the beginning of the pandemic, I gave every superintendent my cell phone. I told them they could call me at two in the morning. I've actually gotten some calls at two in the morning. And we're constantly talking with them about that. The other thing that we're seeing, and this is, this is an important piece, is school divisions at the beginning of the pandemic were making decisions for a quarter or a semester at, the to at a time. We've asked our school divisions to be thinking about being a little bit more flexible. And we're starting to see that. We're seeing schools where if there's a spike in the community, maybe they'll shut down for two weeks, reassess and look again in two weeks. And so we're working through each of those situations. Uh, Scott County, which is on the border of Tennessee, as you know, uh, Tennessee does not have a statewide mask mandate. And so there's an, in an increasing number of cases in Tennessee that's filtering over the line into those border states in Virginia. And so some of those school divisions have said, you know what, we got a holiday break, we got a unique opportunity here, let's close down for a couple of weeks, let's get this under control and we'll come back. And so I think you're gonna see a lot more of, uh, uh, of that where you're seeing more inter intermittent and interim decisions rather than these long-term decisions because the data uh, is, is fluctuating enough to allow them to do that. So, so can I just put words in your mouth and you tell me if, you're, if, if I got it right? 
you <laughs> dangerous, right? Uh, you feel comfortable that the majority or all of the localities are interpreting the guidance within a, a, a responsible kind of uh, set of standards, right? Like some more aggressive, some less aggressive, but you feel like they're all within an area they should be within in terms of how they're interpreted. I think that when you look at the five key mitigation strategies, that in combination with the data is important to assess. And, and we do not collect data on their successful implementation of the five key mitigation strategies. Even CDC would tell you that is, that is a local self-assessment. Right. And I would say that if a school division is implementing the five key mitigation strategies well, that does allow them to be a touch more aggressive. Um, I, but I, I can't say that every school division is is yeah. is uh, exactly where I would put them if I were in that seat. But what I can say is these local school divisions are uh, are they have difficult decisions. Uh, they have they have a, a lot of different constituencies that want a lot of different modalities. And I and I will say that I can't imagine the stress that school boards and superintendents are under. And I think they're making the best decisions they can in the local context with the data that we're providing, using science, looking at their self-assessment of the key mitigation strategies, and, and doing everything they can to keep students safe. Where, whereas we've had certainly some spread in schools, it has not nearly been the spread that we've seen in our communities. Oops, but I, I also want to say, I mean, and this is important, I think that our school divisions have to continue to look at this. You know, cases are on the rise around the nation. Uh, this is, uh, you know, we're, 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 we're not on a downward slope. We're going into flu season. And I just think you're going to see a lot of variability and a lot of uh, changing decisions in the coming months. And so um, it's just really important that we believe, and, and it's, the, it's one of the reasons we set the structure this way, the best decisions of these have to be made in the local context. And we believe our school divisions are doing that. Gotcha. And if I could, Dr. Lane, um, again, not to try to put words into your mouth, um, but I guess what I'm hearing is you've, you've set out a structure, you feel relatively comfortable that that structure is being implemented consistently. I, I guess my, my follow-up question on that is, how how proactive are you at identifying anomalies, um, you know, where you might have a school system that is being uh, maybe too cautious uh, with respect to bringing in uh, students with disabilities or, or English language learners? And so uh, how, how much do you reach out and, um, and try to be proactive about that as opposed to um, waiting for them to come to you if, if they have questions about whether they ought to go from one phase to another? Yeah, and I will I will start by saying I don't know that you can be too cautious, right? I I, I think that's a, a really important piece is that some of our school divisions, uh, especially our school divisions with families in, in higher percentages of poverty, uh, we know that that uh, students of uh, families of certain backgrounds are are more impacted by the coronavirus than others based on the data that we've seen. Um, there, there are uh, there are areas that have less access to hospitals and other things, and so uh, I, I would never question the school division for being too cautious. Uh, and so that's that that's one piece I, I would start with. Uh, but we we do look at the maps. We put them out as you can see about every six weeks. Uh, we do analyze that data side by side with Virginia Department of Health data to see where they are. Um, but but ultimately. What our conversations with superintendents, let's say there were an anomaly, is more about, hey, why have you made the decision you made? When, when, would the, when would the data change your decision? How can we support you as you move forward? And so we see it more as a technical assistance. We are not a health department, so we are, we, we are not really the ones that, that can, can say um, your, your data is at a point where we feel that's unsafe. We feel that's left for the local health department to talk about with the school division. We feel like that's left uh, to uh, the state health department to look at those decisions. But what we do is we take that guidance, we make sure that we put it in the school's context and that we provide them everything that they can to make the best decisions that they can. 
But ultimately, that, that conversation between the superintendent and the local health department director is driving that conversation a lot more than the conversation with the state. We're telling them how to do it. The Department of Health is telling them when. Um, I'm going to ask a, a, a really loaded question that's probably impossible to answer, but um, I, this year is the worst in general, um, just because t teaching virtually is the worst. Um, I, I mean, I have a pounding headache every Friday. I can't even imagine some of these students. Um, and I guess I want, and that's besides the actual learning issues. I, and I guess I wonder, uh, we have to get kids back in school in the fall at the latest. We have to, we just have to. And, and, and I know a lot of this is guided by the national government and, and what the national government does and the resources they can bring to bear. But I, I guess I wonder, I, I think one of the big problems we had in the spring, and this is not, I'm not blaming you. I don't, I don't think you, I think you guys responded better than almost anybody. It's a national, it was a national problem is that we didn't, we didn't have enough foresight to proactively plan for the spring. And that's why the spring just ended. And in, how could we, I guess, right? and that's why the spring ended up being such a, such a hard time. And there were so many kind of contingent decisions in the moment. And so I guess I wonder, when do we start the process of planning for the fall? Uh, in an ideal world, I, you know, especially elementary students, especially elementary students should be back in the classroom, you know, barring a, a complete epic collapse of our ability to handle this disease, this virus. And so uh, when do you guys start the process of thinking about that? Um, how, you know, are you already, how, how are we gonna get from there, from here to there? Because if we wait till the spring, you know, we're gonna see it's already too late and I think the way the last summer played out is an example of, of we were so far behind. And once again, that was the federal response. Uh, I don't know, just thought, tentative thoughts on that. Well, first, let me say, I, I ran into a, a, a parent who is a, a parent of one of your students, and they say you're doing a great job. So uh, <laughs> keep, keep that up. I, I cannot ima imagine teaching advanced placement in a virtual setting, especially. Uh, but um, uh, I, I mean, I think that everything that school divisions are doing now is preparing for the fall. I, I mean, there, there, there are a lot of uh, unanswered questions that will drive some of that thinking, right? I mean, we, we've all seen the positive news on vaccines, but that, that's, that's a huge piece of what it's going to take to get every student back into class. Uh, and, and so we're going to continue to monitor that information. Our team is a part of those work groups. but. You know, abs absent a vaccine, the work that we're doing now to build confidence in the five key mit mitigation strategies, the work that we're doing to encourage everyone to wear masks, get your flu shot, all of the things is, is going to be essential to get the numbers down. But, you know, what's, what's ultimately going to drive how many students we can get into school in the fall is setting the vaccine aside for a minute. How successful can we be in our communities? at reducing transmission so that we can get all of our school divisions into those green categories. And when we get there, I think you're gonna see a lot more confidence in all of our school divisions getting back uh, with more in-person learning. But I think that, uh, you know, we, we, have to, we have to get a little bit more from the scientific community uh, with advancements in the vaccine before I could say that 100% of students will be back in classrooms even in the spring. Dr. Lang, right. this is Delegate Tyler. I was just wondering, what are the school divisions doing for parents who may be educationally challenged or computer illiterate and have a difficult time instructing their children? Yeah, that, that's being done a variety of different ways at LEAs. Uh, they, um, there, there have been a, a number of school divisions working with parents one-on-one, -on -one. you know, they're, for school divisions that are predominantly virtual, they're not, they're not on the whole having in-person parent meetings. And so, you know, they, they, have, they have help desk lines, they, they have uh, people at the schools answering questions. I, my, my kids are in a hybrid situation, so they go to school two days a week and they're at home three days a week. And, uh, you know, my kids are, are often getting a lot of support directly through their teacher. The, the first key is if we can get everybody into a Zoom call, then we can do the training that's necessary. And so the school divisions did a lot of work just teaching parents how to help their students get into the calls. 
once the students are in, then we can support their efforts in how to use the, the, the technology. But but most of the efforts have been Zoom trainings with parents, Zoom meetings, uh, uh, emails, uh, conversations, phone calls home, uh, and uh, you know they the, the the counselors, the social workers are reaching out to families to make sure they're engaged. And so a lot going on there. Of course, the Department of Education, from a state standpoint, we have a number of tools that we've provided to school divisions that they can then turn and use with parents. We have a virtual learning web page. Every week we put out a family engagement newsletter to highlight the activities going on at the department. And so uh, one of the things that I would say uh, I'm, I'm most happy about, again, I, none of us would want a global pandemic. So please don't think that even as there are positives that, that, that we're happy that this happened. But uh, I would say family engagement is the highest I've ever seen it in my career in education. Parents, parents are checking in on how their children are doing. They may not be able to instruct them, but they can at least get them into learning so that the teachers in, in, the, in the synchronous sessions at least can instruct them. But uh, to, to Delegate Van Valkenburg's point, there is no replacement for in-person learning. And our, our long-term goal has got to be getting every student back to school. But we have to do it when the conditions are safe. Uh, but I have seen a lot of efforts going on to get parents engaged and it's working because our parents are more engaged than they've ever been. Dr. Lane, if I could yes. switch gears really quickly, because uh, you had mentioned uh, virtual Virginia and um, you know, I was aware you know, during the uh, regular session last year, trying to figure out how to how to move forward, and it it sounds sounds to me like um, COVID kind of forced your hand, and we were able to get some money and and bring that system up and running, which is great. Um, I, I guess my question, and you, and you touched on this a little bit, is that now that system has to be maintained uh, in order for it to be effective. And I'm just curious whether you have an idea of how much that will cost, um, whether you've coordinated with appropriations, um, it, j just to make sure that we don't have this beautiful tool that all of a sudden uh, you know, we don't have the funding to maintain it and then it loses its relevancy. Uh, thank you. Uh, on November 6th, the Department of Planning and Budget asked us to submit all of our funding requests from each of our agencies. Um, and so I, I'm not supposed to get too far ahead of the governor's uh, decision because he has not made those decisions, but I can assure you that we've uh, put that budget package in. Uh, I'm, I'm blanking on the, the total final cost because we did add some uh, positions to it. And Holly, if you have that number off the top of your head, let me know. But I, I believe that uh, whereas we asked for $7 million last year for startup, because we've been able to do a lot of the startup, I think that number is between 4 and $5 million now in ongoing costs. I think it's right over five, but I will pull it off and share it with you all. Yeah, it might be 5.1 Delegate Bolova with the staffing. Okay, yeah, thank I you. Just put that in the chat. Yeah, so I hit 5.1 on the head. There we go. <laughs> Um, I have a question that doesn't need to be answered now, but I'd just like to put a pin in it for later um, around virtual Virginia as, as it expands. And as I think we will probably see that some of that will, some of that expansion will, will get baked into just how teachers teach. And, as, you know, as we, as we move into, a, uh, uh, oh my goodness, now PBAs, right? And as we move into new forms of assessment, uh, it, there's a tension there because virtual Virginia, a lot of it and a lot of virtual education in general, is just not very high level, uh, which is one of my problems with it. And it doesn't really lend itself to kind of teaching the nuts and bolts of, of some of the things that go with kind of skills based teaching. Uh, so for instance, you know, with my honors kids, I, this quarter, I was like, well, let's just do a research paper. <laughs> I don't want them listening to me on a video for 75 minutes of class. Let's, let's send them off on their own and work on annotated bibliographies and footnotes and thesis statements and topics and straight. And it's really hard to do some of that stuff in a virtual mode and to do it well. And so I guess like, I would love to see how we plan on over the long term, right? Which is why I don't need to answer it now how we plan on making that system uh, really actually make it so that when we're doing performance-based tasks, they're meaningful and they're not just these kind of things that kids toss off virtually and then a virtual teacher 
gives them a mediocre grade and we all move on and say, look how great we're teaching kids. When the reality is we're not teaching them at all because they're just going through the they're just going through the hoops of virtual education. And, and while that's not every kid's virtual experience, it's a lot of them. Uh, there's a reason why kids who are failing get put into a virtual program in counties and cities across the country, right? Which is that they can then just go through that, get their passing grade, we can put them down as having graduated. And so I would love to see a world in which that virtual Virginia transitions successfully to, to the, a form of assessment that we're moving towards, because otherwise, uh, you know, we're pretending to do something we're not. Yeah, well, thank you for that. And uh, I will say, uh, whereas our virtual learning is far superior now to what it was six months ago, it has only been six months. And, yeah. we, you know, we, we've got a long road ahead of us to continue to develop skills in this space. And the skills that we're gaining now, even in the fully virtual spaces, will translate to when we go to more of a blended learning model, which I think is a, a lot of the future of where this is headed. But we agree with you completely on the, the authentic assessment, performance assessment piece. You're going to see some guidance coming out from the department in the next couple of weeks that are going to help move that conversation forward. Because we believe that uh, whereas, whereas our transition to virtual learning has, has been based on our past experiences, the to keep students truly engaged in these virtual settings, you have to have a deeper learning modality. You have to actually make it more engaging because you lose the ability of the engagement in the classroom. And so if you look at our 3R document, we talked a lot about how to leverage this moment to move deeper learning forward. And I think you'll see in some of the guidance we issue here in the coming weeks, how we're going to even continue to move forward the conversation on performance assessment. The tools will allow it. And Virtual Virginia teachers, obviously can do this thing, but remember, Virtual Virginia is something new now. Virtual Virginia is every teacher in the Commonwealth being able to do this. And so we now have a large number of teachers that are doing this well, that we can learn from and continue to translate across the Commonwealth. Other questions from uh, members? Okay, I'm going to come back and hit on a few other things that we're working at the department in a moment, but I'm going to turn it to Emily, who is going to share with you our session now on uh, special education student services, and this was uh, pre-recorded from yesterday. So I'm going to go ahead and share our YouTube video. Hopefully, everybody can hear this. I did practice uh, <laughs> earlier this morning, so hopefully this works. Let's go ahead and play. Dr. Hall. Thank, thank you so much, Dr. Lane. Good morning, uh, DOE staff, Virginia Board of Education, and Emily, I think my audio stopped. I don't know if that's for everybody. For the students uh, with disabilities, as well as the specialized instructional support and services to be successful have also been able to uh, pivot and be dynamic in this changing time. And so I want to start today by offering just a little bit of context for some of the additional supports and services that we have offered through the Department of Education, but particularly through the Department of Special Education Student Services. And so I want to talk first about our response to COVID-19. As many of you have already pointed to, there have been concerns beyond the kind of day-to-day -day instruction and academic supports for students. The department has been working um, as soon as schools closed in March to provide updated guidance and technical assistance to school divisions. And as you can imagine, this um, technical assistance and support has been nowhere needed more than with our parents, families, and caregivers. I'm sure many of you that have children, um, grandchildren, or serve as caregivers for um, some of our students have realized the immense pressure that this has put on our families across the Commonwealth. And so the department has really been able to engage with our families as well as provide targeted resources and assistance to help support this in this and to help support them during this time. And so we've developed a lot of guidance in our specific populations, um, particularly our students with disabilities. Um, as you can imagine, the, the work of providing those specialized instruction support looks a little bit different virtually, but also has an impact on opportunities for teams to meet and 
families need to know during COVID-19, as well as the frequently asked questions document that they can access. Uh, we've also been working to support our teachers. As you can imagine, for students that struggle academically, uh, for students who are English language learners, for students who are from populations that might be experiencing extreme challenge and stress during this time, like our military connected students, as well as our students with disabilities, really require a little bit of a more um, unique lens to how virtual instruction or the provision of remote instruction can look. And so we've really been working to support teachers, paraprofessionals, and our specialized instructional support staff on how best to work with these populations and really be poised to support them day in and day out. And as you can imagine, that's just not for our teachers and administrators, but for our school counselors, our school psychologists, our school social workers, and our school nurses become really part of that wraparound support network to students. And so we have upped our ability to touch base with them in the field, and we've held a weekly, bi-weekly, and monthly calls with various groups of those folks so that we're hearing directly from them and able to provide contextualized support that they're requesting and answer really important questions, as well as adjust the challenges that they may be facing everywhere from tide water to Northern Virginia to far Southwest Virginia. As Dr. Lane stated earlier, the department has been very rapid in our response and providing additional resources, particularly through CARES and GEAR Act funding. And as he stated, a lot of this funding has been directly um, supportive of student social, emotional learning and development. So we realized during this time, it's not just about learning about those core instructional components. It's really about providing support to students and really making sure that we're supporting our education professionals as they work in these different environments. And so we've been able to uh, dedicate direct funding to serve students with disabilities across the Commonwealth. And that funding was directly allocated to each school division based upon the number of students with disabilities that they currently have, as well as identified areas of funding for social emotional learning support and school-based mental health services. And we have seen such a great use of these resources already by our local school divisions. Everything from developed social emotional learning screening tools to pick up on issues and areas of concern that our students and families might be facing, as well as to help staff additional school mental health providers within the educational setting. And so hiring an extra school counselor or having an extra school psychologist or decreasing some of those ratios in order to provide support to students has been just a few examples of how divisions have utilized their funding to date. We continue to work directly with them as well as amping up our resources that are available online and on demand for these providers at the state level. So everything from a toolkit for school counselors to see, hey, what is um, a more frequent touch base virtually look like for students who are struggling to helping our school nurses think through some of the healthcare guidance and tools that they might need as well as providing support for personal protective equipment to some of our more vulnerable student populations. We've also taken a unique role in ensuring that our local school divisions are up to date with any guidance and information that's coming from the U.S. Department of Education. And I'm happy to report that we've worked very closely with our partners in the Office of Special Ed Programs to ensure that while there have been no waivers to the requirements of IDEA, meaning that every student in the Commonwealth identified with a disability is still being afforded the protections and services of that act, really helping everything from IEP teams meeting virtually to helping divisions talk about compensatory services that may be required as a result of the closures in the spring. It's really been a privilege to work with the Secretary of Education as well as our Board of Education members to make sure that we've got our ear to the ground hearing what practitioners have needed and being able to be responsive to that, whether it be resources around a specific topic, whether it be professional development and technical assistance, or whether it just be an ear to talk to and work through a situation that's happening on the ground. I also want to talk a little bit more specifically about some of the ongoing work in the Department of Special Education and Student Services. Um, we are always busy in SDSS, but it definitely has seemed even more so. Obviously, many of you are uh, very well aware of some of the areas of legislative action that we've been responsive to, and I've provided a little bit of update here just on some of those items that we think might be uh, really important for you all as you enter into the session, but obviously have communications with stakeholders as well. We are very excited about our work about the development of statewide social emotional learning standards. Um, if you think about this, it's really like the SOLs for SEL, really how are we communicating the priorities around social emotional learning? And it's just been such a pleasure to work with divisions who are a little bit further down this road and those who are very interested in kind of getting on the on-ramp. It's really helping to provide support to them, but also be very clear about this as a priority from the Virginia Department of Education on really having that wraparound support of students to, students to go above and beyond academic support. Uh, we're also very excited by the end of this calendar year, we'll be able to release 
our guidance around transgender student model policies, and this has been the result of many months of work and many engaging and amazing conversations with stakeholder groups, um, many of which have um, had student representatives and young adults from around the Commonwealth. And I will say on behalf of um, myself and ourselves, we have learned so much in the value that has been created in having these conversations. I think you will see shine through this model guidance. And I think it will be very helpful to our school divisions in really thinking about how to support their students and really thinking about their approach to inclusivity on a systemic level. Obviously, the department works on uh, literacy initiatives, and as Dr. Lane will tell you, this is one of the things that he is very concerned with, with making sure that every student in the Commonwealth has access to quality reading instruction and is able to really show progress and, and development in this area. And we work across the agency on improving literacy instruction. And much of this work has really benefited from some updated research and guidance that has been in the field. And so we continue to work with local school divisions as well as our partners in higher education to ensure that the tools, resources, and instruction that school divisions have available is based on the evidence-based approaches and the science of reading. And so we're working um, continually with our partners on the phonemic awareness literacy screener and updating that piece of information that many of our school divisions use in order to uh, kind of sample what their student skills and development looks like. But then also working with targeted groups of supporters like our dyslexia advisors that are located in each one of our school divisions to ensure that they have access to the latest and greatest research and development around literacy. Everything from rapid automized naming to different screening tools that can be available to ensure that each and every student is receiving quality reading instruction and can be identified to um, make sure that if they're experiencing challenges or a lack of success in that area, how can we kind of uh, support that work and, and work really well to support our teachers in knowing what evidence-based approaches to literacy look like. We've also been really excited to work with um, a variety of different partners over the last year to 18 months. Um, I mentioned that we maintain a close relationship with our federal partners, particularly from the Office of Special Education Programs at the U.S. Department of Education. Virginia was um, uh, received a monitoring visit, which is pretty typical of what states go through, particularly in special education, back in May 2019. And in June 2020, we were at, uh, provided with the report for that, and we continue to work with our federal partners. That report identified some issues around procedure and practice and policy, and so it's really given the department an opportunity to be responsive to updating many of those policies and practices. Um, that have impacted some of our dispute resolution options and I think really just brought us up to speed with where we want to be in 2020 and being responsive to specific complaints, particularly from individuals, families, advocates around special education. We've also been uh, very pleased to work with the General Assembly's Joint Legislative Audit and Review Commission over the last year. As many of you know, in December, they're planning to release a study that they have done across the state on special education. And the department, I think, is really excited about the constructive recommendations that we'll see through that process. And we've also been at the table for other discussions and other areas that impact our provision of specialized um, instruction and support to students across the Commonwealth. And so we really appreciate the opportunity to be at the table and to have constructive conversations, but most importantly, to link up individuals with folks out there in the, out there in the field, our central office leaders, our principals, and our teachers doing this work day in and day out. So at this point, I want to be responsive to time, and I'm going to pause. Um, we do have an opportunity. I'm happy to answer any specific questions uh, regarding the work in special education and student services. But as always, um, myself, as well as the staff in my department, is available to answer any specific inquiries. Or if you'd like a little bit more of a detailed update around any of the pieces of legislation, we're happy to provide that. Thank you, Dr. OK. So. Uh, apologize that uh, Dr. Collins couldn't be here in person, but uh, you know, uh, uh, two days in a row was tough with the number of uh, sports we're, that we're providing the school divisions. But we have a team here ready to answer your questions in the area of special education and student supports as well. So, Dr. Lane, um, could could you go in a little bit deeper, I guess, about the status of uh ran and its integration or relationship with pals for uh screening for dyslexia because i know uh last session the regular session we had a lot of frustration trying to work out specific budget language um and that kind of fell apart uh with the idea that we would come back during this uh, session and of course that's been made tough with uh, uh the pandemic and trying to get all that together but 
Uh, can, can you do a little bit of a deeper dive as far as how you've worked with the stakeholders and, and whether we're close to coming with something that, um, you know, DOE as, as well as uh, UVA and um, groups like De Decoding Dyslexia, where maybe we can get on the same page? And uh, I'm happy to take that, but Holly, I know you've been working really closely with Samantha on that. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So, Doug at Bolova, we have had um, some conversations both with the um, instruction and with our colleagues at UVA, but also with Delegate Hope on this matter um, as we have kind of uh, tried to assess where we can make progress together. So, um, PALS 2.0 was uh, piloted this fall, even with some of the delays because of the lack of assessments in the spring, they were able to move forward on some of that pilot work this fall. So while we aren't exactly where we thought we would be on that, um, progress is still still being made. Um, in the interim, I know that both the team at UVA and our team from um, special education and, and student services and instruction has been meeting with um, the advocates and engaging in a lot of training for our dyslexia advisors in particular, uh, that that has rolled out this fall uh, to equip the dyslexia advisors that are in every division um, to understand um, the, the nuts and bolts of some of this RANRAS work and start embedding those, those conversations. Uh, Maribel may be able to speak in greater detail about that work that's underway this fall, um, but I, I would say generally um, the conversation has continued. Um, I, I think that we are in a better place, um, and I, I think I can safely speak for everybody on that matter, including Delegate Hope, as we've continued the conversations with him and his constituents as well. Maribel, anything you want to add in there? No, Holly, I think you covered it. Thank you. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you, Holly. Yep. Other questions uh, from members? Okay, and I should just say really quickly before we go to the next section, I, I'm sure since the last session, you you knew Holly as the Deputy Secretary of Education, but mm -hmm. Holly is now the Assistant Superintendent uh, for Policy, Equity, and Communications at the department. So in in this next upcoming session, you'll be seeing Holly in a slightly different role from what you, you saw her doing last year, and we're just so excited to have her on the team. So thank you, Holly. Thanks. Uh, so the next section of our presentation, I'm just going to give you a few quick updates on other work going on at the department that I know that you're interested in. Uh, and the first is going to be in early childhood. So Emily, thank you. So of course, uh, again, a huge kudos and thank you to the General Assembly for the work that you're doing to align governance of early childhood under the Department of Education. Uh, obviously, we've we've already begun to transition uh, quality uh, and the professional development team and the Head Start Collaboration Office over to VDOE. Uh, we executed an initial MOA uh, for the quality initiatives and some of the work related to CC uh, DBG from DSS to DOE effective July 1. Um, we have additional MOAs. Uh, we actually had a transition team meeting just after uh, yesterday afternoon on this uh, and, and are, are, are moving along in that really well. Um, the board in the near future will begin recruiting for the, the Early Childhood Advisory Committee, uh, which uh, serves uh, a purpose related to our grants as well. But mostly, I just wanted to tell you how excited we are at the department to do this work. Uh, we, um, we see early childhood as one of our essential equity initiatives. We know that there are achievement gaps on the first day of kindergarten. And if we're ever gonna get to a place of true equity in the Commonwealth, uh, we have to start early. Um, and this, this, this must be an educational initiative in, in, in addition to the, the many other facets that, that we uh, provide in early childhood. And so um, obviously Jenna Conway is leading this work at the department. They're doing just a, a phenomenal job with this. And, uh, and I think that, uh, you'll be proud to know that the transition is, is, is moving along uh, along well. Uh, on the next page, just a few other pieces. I wanted to tell you a little bit about some of our equity work and uh, a kudos to Leah Walker, who's on the call. She can help answer questions in this area, but many of you know the, the profile of Virginia graduate and our five C's of uh, uh, you know critical thinking, creative thinking, communication, collaboration, and citizenship. 
Leah created a roadmap to equity in the Commonwealth and created the five C's of that equity. Uh, and uh, I could do a whole presentation on that, but the five C's of equity are everything from cultural confidence, confidence to culturally relevant teaching, to compassionate student engagement, to continuous reflection. And we're just uh, really excited about the work that Leah's team is doing to build equity uh, throughout the Commonwealth. We also host uh, an equity summit. Uh, it was actually our first ever all virtual conference at the DOE and it went off uh, just perfectly under Leah's leadership. Uh, I will tell you it's not on the slide, but uh, the week of December 1st is going to be Ed Equity VA week. We're going to announce the Mary Peak Award for Education Excellence or Excellence in Education Equity. Uh, and we're going to have major keynote speakers, uh, former uh, Obama administration uh, Secretary John King will be a speaker, Gloria Latson Billings will be a speaker, and just continuing to move uh, forward great work on, on uh, education equity. Uh, we have uh, also uh, accepted the recommendations of the African American History Education Commission. Last month, the board took action to revise the framework to include all of the technical edits that they wanted to the framework immediately, plus one actually uh, standards revision. And in January, just in about 60 days, we'll be launching the 2022 standards review and using the African American History Education Commission's recommendations to be uh, a strong basis uh, for the, the next major update to our standards for the next seven years. They also recommended a number of uh, professional development and teacher training uh, requirements. And obviously, as you uh, enter into the session, you'll want to make sure you're, you're familiar with those as well. Uh, the Department of Education wanted to make sure that we were modeling what we were asking our school divisions to do. So we have been engaged in a year-long training in education equity in partnership with VCU to make sure that we have cultural competence on our DOE leadership team, so that as we're leading school divisions, uh, we're leading it in a lens of equity. Uh, and then finally, and, and any of us will be able to answer questions, I wanted to let you know that uh, we, we, are in, we are a part of three JLARC reports at the same time, and I will tell you that's a lot of work uh, for, for those of you on JLARC. Uh, but um, the first report on the department came out in October, uh, and uh, it was the management of the agency, and I, hopefully you've had a chance to read that. Uh, overwhelmingly, the report was positive about the, the management of the, of the agency, but certainly they gave us some things to work on, especially in areas of diversity, school improvement, and teacher recruitment. We take that report very seriously. We are already putting things in place to make sure uh, we're addressing that. This month, next week, uh, will be the report on the Office of Children's Services. And obviously, there's a significant amount of funding that flows through Children's Services for private day placements for special education students. And so that will have some impact on the department. We've been a part of that study. And then finally, in December, JLARC will receive, release the full report on special education to make sure that we're maximizing opportunities uh, for students with disabilities. Uh, and any findings that they have, uh, you can rest assured that we take them seriously. When I came to the department, we had a significant number of financial audit findings, and you will find in last year's audit and hopefully this year's audit that we've significantly eliminated those. So when, when, we, when we find that there are problems, you have an agency here that quickly acts to, to resolve those matters. Um, and then, of course, I think uh, as, as we move forward to the board's presentation, I, I can't underscore uh, the amount of work that our teachers are doing with this pandemic. Um, uh, the, and recognizing this is a, a significant budget year, I talked about teacher shortages, but I wanted to step back because I forgot to talk about the, the significant need that we have to continue to press the issue on teacher salary, teacher mentoring, principal support. And, uh, and you'll hear more about that in the next section with the board. But there I will pause and answer any questions that you have. And certainly Leo is available to answer questions on equity and any of us can talk about early childhood or JLARC as well. Is there any sense of, and I know it's early days, but is there any sense of how much more of a hole we're gonna be in for needing teachers as we go into next year? And then the kind of follow-up question to that is, um, do we have any sense of trends of the types of teachers who are leaving the profession because of COVID, whether it's, uh, you know, particularly age demographic, uh, racial demographic, urban versus rural, demo, you know, urban versus rural teachers, something like that. 
like, is there just any sense of how much worse it's going to be? And maybe it won't be worse at all, but I mean, it's, you know, you certainly can't go very, very long without seeing articles about teachers threatening to quit, which is incredibly frustrating, but I guess unavoidable. Well, certainly I, I think our teachers would, would, uh, uh, like to be compensated for the additional work they're having to do uh, in the pandemic. But uh, right now, I would say, Delegate Van Valkenburg, anything that I give you would be anecdotal. That October 30 report that I mentioned about 20 minutes ago will be essential. Uh, obviously, the, the collection period ended uh, October 30th. So we're actually actually collecting the data now. But anecdotally, I can say we, we have seen uh, definitely an increase in the number of teachers that decided to retire that qualified for retirement. Many of our teachers don't retire immediately once they hit the 30 years. There are benefits, for instance, uh, with, with what we call PLOP and getting to 33. And you know, many teachers just made that decision. So that, that ends up being uh, somewhat of an across the, the board uh, issue. Um, obviously, uh, some of our teachers that higher risk of severe illness, even though school divisions are uh, supposed to be giving those teachers uh, uh, remote assignments and, and, and we think that's happening, but uh, certainly we'll work with school divisions where they're not doing that. Uh, many, even in that context, decided, you know what, I'm at higher risk of illness, I'm gonna, I'm gonna step aside at this time. So the, the real depth of the number will be out with that report, which again, I hope I, hope I have for you by January, uh, but, um, but they're, they're certainly, certainly we're seeing that. But on, on the other hand, one of the things that could help us in the long run is with CARES Act funding, school divisions have created extra positions. And so what we're hoping is, you know, when CARES Act funds go away, obviously those positions will not be maintained because you won't, you won't need all the physical distancing and everything else. And so we're hoping they've hired enough teachers to fill some of those voids that have happened with retirements or, or separations. Uh, but uh, again, I, I, I other than anecdotal information, I'd rather come back to you in January with that data. Yeah, I mean, I figured that would be the case. I just thought I'd ask. Other questions? This is Delegate Tyler, um, and I guess this will go to Leah, um, since we're talking about equity. I noticed um, on the news the other day, um, we were talking about segregation. Segregation is is more vigilant now than during the civil rights movement. Um, are we finding that this is becoming a more prevalent problem across the Commonwealth? Uh, hi, uh, yeah, Delegate Tyler, yes. Actually, um, we have seen an increase in the concentration of both poverty and concentration of students by racial demographics in particular schools. Um, what we know are also associated with those concentrations are um, a higher likelihood that students who attend schools that are concentrated by both poverty and race um, are more likely to have um, least, less experienced teachers teaching in those classrooms and resource distribution um, certainly is impacted uh, in terms of supporting the, the different needs that those students might have um, and the concentration of those needs in those particular schools. And so over the last 10 years, there has been a, a tremendous increase, in fact, in the concentration of both poverty and students by race in schools across the Commonwealth. Um, I know there's a study that was recently released in the, in the last day or so. There's also a lot of work in this space from the Commonwealth Institute um, who regularly uh, reports on the concentration of students by race and poverty within schools. And Delegate Tyler, I'll just add one thing to that. And uh, this is actually a repetition of something Mr. Gecker said yesterday. Uh, the Constitution of Virginia does give the, the Board of Education the authority to assess the effectiveness of school division lines. But in the 1970s, the General Assembly did pass some code language that essentially uh, made that work really difficult to do. And so that if this is an area of interest, it, it might be worth uh, taking a look at that language and, and making sure that uh, you're still comfortable with it or not. Uh, and uh, happy to send you information on that if you'd like. That'd be fine. Okay, other, Thank you. Thank you, Delegate Tyler. Any other questions uh, from the members? 
Okay, we're going to turn to our last section now, and this is a briefing from the Board of Education. Uh, and this is also pre-recorded from yesterday, but I'll be happy to stay on at the end and answer any questions. I guess that we have a PowerPoint and we have a presentation as the way this all works. Uh, you know, I am reminded an hour and a half into this of, you know, one of my old teachers used to say, the mind can absorb no more than the seat can endure. So uh, those of you without your cameras on, I'm assuming you're standing by this time. Those of you with your cameras on, I will take no offense if you decide to stand up and take a quick stretch break. Uh, we've been going at this a long time. You know, I am delighted to have uh, with me you know, Dr. Jamel Wilson, Vice President of the Board. Uh, and I thank all of you for taking the time uh, you know, to allow us to present to you what we think is important going forward. You know, I usually don't start this way, but I, I ought to say that uh, because my personality is such that I want to fix problems, and so I tend to focus on what needs to be fixed more than what we're doing right. You know, Dr. Lane covered a lot of what we're doing right. I would say, you know, 85% of, uh, of what we do, we're doing pretty well. And what you're going to hear today in terms of the direction of the board is really focused on that remaining 15 to 20% that, you know, we believe we can do better. Uh, can you flip the slide? I don't have control over this. So. Thank you. Uh, in 2017, uh, the Board of Ed, which, by the way, uh, has become you know, one of the hardest working and most committed boards in the Commonwealth. Uh, you know, our current seven members do an awful lot of work. We are very actively engaged in the working board. Uh, but we adopted our comprehensive uh, work plan. And we wanted to focus on three areas. The plan, by the way, goes for five years. Uh, and the three items that we wanted to focus on, and you know, those are the priorities, but the items of focus are equity in our schools, teachers and building leadership, and accountability. And we began to work, we formed the committees, and we began to do work on uh, what do we mean by equity? How do we accomplish equity? And for the board, the idea of equity is that we provide the resources necessary to have each child potential. Uh, features in building leadership ought to be obvious and accountability we will get to. Uh, go ahead and go to slide two, because we're going to talk around this when we get the... Uh, uh, you know, I am a lawyer by training, and I tend to go back to sort of source documents. And so you will forgive me if for a minute we talk a little bit about the source of the board's power uh, and, you know, how the General Assembly and the board interact. You know, most of you know that, I hope all of you know that in 1971, Virginia adopted a new constitution. Uh, in that constitution, uh, power was given to the board, in fact, the requirement to the board that we prescribe standards of quality for each by any, uh, for, you know, from time to time is the actual language subject to revision only by the General Assembly. Uh, in his commentaries on the Constitution, uh, Dick Howard, who was chair of the committee that wrote the Constitution, says the following, uh, the Board of Education has a role which it must play, and the General Assembly has a role which it may play in setting standards of quality. The Board prescribes the standards, but the Assembly, if it chooses to exercise the power, can make the ultimate decision as to what those standards should be. The assembly decides not only whether to exercise the power, but also what procedure it wants to adopt and review the board standards. From 71 through give or take 82, uh, the Board of Education actually did biannually uh, adopt or prescribe standards of quality. And the legislature in each of those, in each of those times chose to make minor modifications and kept the standards of quality as uncodified indicating to everybody that they were intended to be temporary, uh, not part of the code forever, uh, and would be likely changed in the next biennium. Uh, in 1984, the legislature took the step of codifying the SOQs, thus sort of changing the historic practice and really the constitutional practice of how the standards uh, got done. And you also passed uh, statutes essentially calling for the board to make recommendations with regard to changes as opposed to actually prescribing changes. In 2019, uh, for the first time in, in over 20 years, uh, the board followed its constitutional mandate and actually prescribed standards of quality. 
Uh, there were two bills carried that had the board's prescribed uh, standards in them. You know, uh, one uh, and the other by Delegate Ayer. Uh, neither of them really made it up through the money committees. Uh, we recently, by the way, uh, re-prescribed those same standards of quality that we did in 2019, and we look forward to this General Assembly session and an opportunity to talk with all of the, all the members about what we believe is important and why we believe changes ought to be made. Okay, can you go to the next slide, please? All right. Uh, everybody always wants to jump to the money slide. Uh, however, I'd like to talk instead of about the money, but about the policy changes that the board's prescribed standards of quality represent. You know, and I think James alluded to this, you know, a little bit. As I said, the board, before it prescribed in 2019, uh, did a fair amount of work looking at different studies, uh, talking to stakeholder groups, you know, all the things that committees do to reach a bit, to uh, reach consensus and conclusions. And, you know, honestly, we started off with the idea that if we were going to achieve equity in our schools, we would have to provide, you know, the greater social service wraparound and other direct services to those places which were currently underserved. And, but where we ended up was with really what should not have been a startling conclusion, which is that the most important thing we have teaching, you know, in the buildings with our children are the teachers. And that if we want to improve the outcomes, honestly, we're going to have to focus on both teachers and building leadership, leadership meaning principals. Uh, just to give you some statistics, in 2018-19, uh, it was clear that inexperienced and provisionally licensed teachers were concentrated in Virginia's high poverty schools. High poverty schools uh, have an average of 7.2% inexperienced teachers, that is, teachers in their first year of teaching and 10.3% provisionally licensed teachers. Uh, contrast that with low poverty schools, uh, which have an average of 4% inexperienced teachers and 6.3% uh, licensed teachers. It has been suggested in the research that uh, up to 25% of the variance of test scores can be attributed to differences in teacher quality. Uh, research indicates that being taught by a teacher in the top four title of effectiveness for four consecutive years would actually eliminate uh, the achievement gap between black and white students. Uh, in the Commonwealth, black students are nearly two times to be likely uh, assigned an ineffective teacher uh, and half as likely to be assigned the most effective teachers. Uh, these inequities are reflected within different schools and single divisions and across school divisions. Uh, what the equity fund, which is the first item of the uh, slide here would do is provide resources for poor divisions to attract uh, experienced teachers or use those funds to reduce class size. It would actually mandate that the funds be used either, as I said, number one, to attract uh, more experienced teachers or to reduce class size. You know, a student unaccredited school in the Commonwealth is uh, twice as likely to have a first year teacher or a teacher teaching outside their endorsed area than a teacher in an accredited school. You know, it's clear that we need to change the mix and have some redistribution. And the equity fund proposal proposes to do that, by, as I said, providing those additional funds for the poorer divisions to make those changes. Uh, delegate. I had mentioned or had asked questions about uh, teacher retention, <coughs> excuse me, and recruitment. I'd like to address just a few of those things now. In terms of statistics, I'll give you, if you take a look at the annual report from 2019 from the Board of, Ed, uh, from the Board of Education, you'll see a fair number of statistics dealing with where we are. Uh, you can also look to a report done by the Curry School in 2017 in conjunction with the Advisory Committee on Teacher Shortages to get some fairly good data. Uh, it has been suggested and I think accurate that we can reduce significantly the uh, shortage by improving teacher retention. If you, and I think Delegate Guy mentioned that, uh, you know, it is clear that if you keep them at four five, you get to keep them but you tend to lose a fair number before five. One of the most significant reasons people leave the profession, according again to uh, the Curry School study, is that they feel the lack of support. 
uh, one of the uh, other SOQ uh, prescriptions would be the provision of a mentoring program for younger teachers uh, with the goal of keeping them in and keeping them in the profession. Uh, there you go. Thank you for working the slide. Uh, in addition, uh, there is a significant positive correlation between quality of building leadership and student outcome. Uh, we would provide for principal mentorship. I'm not going to go over all of these. I know we've been doing this a long time and we've got 15 minutes left. And, uh, but you can see essentially where the focus of the uh, prescribed standards of quality is. Uh, I know last year, you know, the legislature increased uh, the at-risk add-on. Uh, and we think that's great. Uh, I don't really care if you name the equity fund at-risk add-on, but my key takeaway for this uh, is that we would like you to change the focus of the use of the money to the acquisition of higher quality more experienced teachers in poor areas. And you can move on with the slides. Okay. All right, this is just... Uh, you know, the, the obligatory financial slide showing sort of uh, the distribution. Zach, you could probably speak to this better than any of us since I think this was your slide in the early days. You can flip right past this one. Okay. Uh, as I said, our board is committed to equity. Uh, we believe that equity comes first from uh, the change of structure of public education funding. Uh, and we believe that the prescribed SOQs would provide uh, that measure of equity. Uh, we seek to prioritize equity in every facet of the public education system, and that includes, as we just mentioned, redistricting. Uh, and we want to ensure, as said here, that uh, Virginia students learn all history, uh, not just the uh, you know currently taught history. And the board has taken steps recently, as Dr. Lane Messick mentioned to adopt the uh, suggestions from the African, African American History Education Commission. You can flip the next one. Okay, uh, Dr. Lane also mentioned we're gonna go through the history and social science standards. Uh, we can move on to the next one because that's, that's been covered. Okay, this one, uh, you know, 20 plus years ago, the, there was a major shift in accountability. The SOL assessments came in. And honestly, although there has been a lot of criticism of the uh, accountability system at that time and the use of SOLs for this purpose, the truth is, I think, that the underlying theory of that framework of accreditation was a good one. That is, we need to be able to measure what people are doing uh, in order to find out where improvements are needed and help guide those improvements. I think, uh, you know, in 2000, uh, I guess a couple of years ago, our board instituted a new system of accreditation based much more significantly on growth than on uh, than the previous system was. You know, I think that one of them, the board believes that one of the mistakes made uh, with the SOL-based system was that they didn't go back fairly early uh, after its adoption and look at what things were going well and what things were going poorly. That is, you know, I believe strongly that they could have over time tinkered with the SOA in order to improve it without having some of the negative consequences and significant negative consequences we've seen over the last 20 years. This board has chosen to form a committee uh, to review the new SOA, uh, and has been, that committee has been very active, so that we can catch early on those areas where we're doing well, and frankly fix those areas where we're seeing unintended consequences uh, from those standards. Uh, this is just, the, there's no action by the legislature needed on this. I just thought y'all to know that this work with regard to changes in the SOA is ongoing. Now, it's also interesting that during COVID, we've sort of waived accreditation because we have no baseline measures. And, uh, you know, so some of those things we won't know until we get back to a more normalized school situation. However, I will say that even to date, the feedback we've gotten from various participants in our meetings, including, you know, a fair number of uh, division superintendents, has been very helpful. And I do believe that there will be changes made. 
made, minor adjustments made as we move forward. Okay, next slide. Upcoming, uh, you know, Dr. Lane talked about, uh, you know, we now have early childhood education that will come in full force. Uh, Senator Lucas and I were on a committee to deal with uh, gifted education uh, admissions uh, that has not resulted in, but certainly informed some of the work of uh, the recently adopted revisions to gifted education regulations on the board. And we appreciate that work uh, so that that's not too unclear. There was a lot of work done with regard to admissions at TJ, in particular at the governor's schools. Uh, the board itself has no role in that. Uh, however, we do have a role with regard to gifted education. Uh, I will say, Senator Lucas, if you haven't had a chance to read our regs yet, one of the things that I think is most important that we've done is that we require a pipeline. You know, we can change the admission standards now, uh, but we still need to uh, change how we are identifying gifted and make sure that there is indeed a real pipeline starting earlier in the education process for those students uh, who are gifted to uh, have their potential recognized. Okay. I think, believe it or not, in very few minutes that covers everything. Are there any questions? And uh, Dr. Wilson, do you have anything you'd like to add? All right. Uh, thank you all so much for uh, uh, tuning into the board's information, the work they've done on assessing the standards of quality and, and the number of other items that President Gecker talked about are, are, are so essential to our work. Uh, and with that, I, I or any member of the team can answer any questions that you have on uh, the board's report. Hey, Dr. Lane, just out of curiosity, because I know at the end they touched a little bit on the um, governor's school admission processes. And, you know, that was uh, uh, Secretary Carney's effort, um, you know, to, to bring in some stakeholders and get some feedback. And, you know, I guess there was a couple of different ways that that information could be used. Um, and I am aware that Fairfax County Public Schools has already started to act on that uh, independently. And, and so do you know at this point whether there will be legislation um, introduced and supported by the administration? Uh, is this just going to be something that the board will continue to take under advisement? Or uh, have we accomplished what we needed to accomplish by getting the attention of, of some of our governor's schools that know that they needed to make some changes, um, particularly with testing and, and the pipeline development? Thank you for the question, Delegate Bulova. I, you're, you're correct that that project uh, and, and study was being run out of the secretary's office. I do know he has some very specific recommendations he's making to the governor, but I cannot at this time say whether it will be legislation or anything like that. But I think that as we get closer to session and the governor's announcement of his budget and legislative priorities, uh, I, I, I think that this is a topic I know the secretary is very focused on. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Doug Van Barkenberg, I thought you uh, unmuted for a second. Uh, I, I did. Update. I'm not going to ask it. I'm going to save it. Okay. About governor's yeah. schools, but it's not an answerable question, I don't think. I'll save it for another forum. Well, certainly feel free back at the circle back with us. Uh, well, that is that is our information for the day. We really thank you all so much uh, for taking a couple hours with us. So, so much has happened in education over the last six months. I just want to give a huge kudos to the team at DOE for everything they've done, but also to the teachers, support staff, principals, superintendents, school board members, just really working hard out there for you. So uh, just, just know that how much we appreciate it, and I'm sure you do as well. Delegate Tyler, I, I would love to turn it over to you for final comments or, or just a goodbye. Well, thank you, Dr. Lane, and thank you um, and your staff for the informative information um, and all the legislators who um, stayed two hours on a call this morning. Um, certainly, we do have some challenges due to COVID, 
Um, but we see with excellent staff and leadership that we are addressing a lot of the problems that um, affecting our children and the education system due to COVID. Again, we want to thank you for your hard work and uh, we look forward to um, our continuing relationship and what we can do to help you out in the coming session in January. Again, thank you. All right. Thank you all so much for being with us. Thank you, everybody.